All right, um, Matt, thank you so much for joining me today in Pink Sofa Conversation. It's great. You're the second person visiting my, my sofa virtually because we're in quarantine. Coronavirus is spreading and people are staying at home. So we need to keep entertained and it's lovely to have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Matt and I, we met years ago. We were both uh, artists in Bau Art. At that time, it was an open studio, which, you know, you could sneak in and see people. And in order to get to my studio, I always had to pass through Matt's studio. And I would see this little mess, let's be honest, Matt, and full of bottles of wine and things <laughs> hanging around and a used chair and all the portraits that you can see on the background of, of his, um, of the image. Matt, is your studio still looking like that? Is it still the flair? It's even more chaotic than it was before. I need, I need certain conditions to work in, you know, I need like a controlled chaos. Um, yeah. I don't think that's possible to have it even more of a mess, but you had your... Oh, uh, is it? Yeah, okay. So, uh, I think the most recognizable uh, drawings and uh, canvases, and by the way, I have two from my collection that I, I got from you, uh, are the ones know. that you have behind you. Tell us, it's, is it oil on canvases? And what's the story there? Because I remember that when, we, when you showed me, and it's really, I recommend people to go and visit you in your studio, because there's so many layers of information and you're reworking on old pieces, but then adding new, and the texture that you, your paintings have is quite strong and very heavy. What is the technical side of, of your work? Well, I use acrylic, they're all on canvas. Um, I vary the canvas surfaces because that changes the way you paint. Sometimes you use linen, sometimes I use cotton canvas, it depends. So then you get a subtly different image each time. Um, my paintings are, are very simply constructed. It's a very basic form I use. I use a restricted palette of about maybe six colors, seven colors. And the way I actually structure them is very simple. And um, probably each painting consists of about maybe 12 layers of paint. 10. 12? Wow. Very, it's an illusion I create. You think People think I've slayed on them for weeks and I haven't. It's like, I can paint one in a day. I'm not roasting, I'm just, I'm just giving, giving you the facts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's a very simple formula I've perfected over the years and I can, that's why I'm so productive. They're yeah. very simply made. Yeah. And I do think that uh, because I know some of the people of your circle and then you're always inspired by the people that are around you. And it's not only that maybe you have developed a very, you know, technique or a technique that is becoming quite simplistic and effective for you and you can create all these layers quite fast. Also acrylic does dry quite fast, but I can, I think you've mm -hmm. also achieved this very like almost minimalist way of representing people where you still can see them, but you still see that it's you drawing them. How how do you feel about your own language and how do you feel this portrait language very much Matthew to do that is, you know, very like very, you know, symbolic of your of your pieces and of your work piece of work for the last ten years? Yeah, well I, I, the portrait series began when I was at university. I just bought some canvases of the same size just to start because I didn't know where to begin. I was completely lost at university on my MA um, 10 years ago and it developed out of that and I, I developed an obsession with that format of portraits. Some are self-portraits, some are portraits of friends like I painted you, I painted I paint anonymous people. It depends what I'm focusing on at the time. It can be quite random um, but very, very often they don't look like the person. They look sometimes like other people. Yeah. So there's always that, I think, unconscious element in my work. So I'm a very intuitive painter. I work, I don't think when I paint. Yeah. So I think I'm always drawing on the unconscious, just as much as I'm making observations of people and analyzing structures, I'm also drawing on the unconscious mind. Yeah. So, but it is a very intuitive way of working, but it's also, an, it's also about obsession as well. I'm just obsessed with the portrait format. But the point is, I'm actually a figurative painter. People assume that I just paint portraits, but I do paint figures. I don't just show them very often. I never exhibit them, but I'm actually, I paint um, lots of figures. I just exhibit the portraits. So people form this opinion that I'm just a portraitist and I'm not. Yeah. Because that's all they ever see. Yeah. Well, that's on you because you don't show us the rest, but I have seen some of your figures and they do touch a, a little bit. Yeah, I can see maybe there's a cubist 
influence there. And yeah, so also, influence, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Maybe yeah, analyzing and dig the form. Yeah. Yeah, and I also think that in your case, you are like you do represent this almost stereotypical idea of an artist in the sense of chaotic studio, like in the with the paint. When when you when I see you, and you see you have paint everywhere and things like that. Do you think that this is something that has happened by accident or is it maybe unconsciously that you're like very comfortable in this idea of you know the, the image of what a like an artist used to be like hundreds of years ago? I, I'm, I'm very comfortable being a painter. I, I focus on painting because I, I really love that great tradition. I mean, I mean many people today are, are what I call artists, they, they're multidisciplinary. In, in a way like you, they do photography, they paint, they sculpt, you know, it's all ideas based now. Uh, and I just focus on traditional painting, which, and I, I suppose I'm very much in love with the idea of being a painter yeah. and living like a painter. You know, um, I, li I live a very courteous life generally, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. Uh, and if I'm honest, I, I suppose I sort of revel in that in a way. Yeah, that's your way <laughs> of, of kind of like, kicking back society kind of like being a little bit out outside of the the idea of what a current artist has to be but also like a current citizen not in the way that you have your edgy ways so when we talk about influences i do see cubism in your way 100 percent and we were yeah. discussing before uh, that you know you also have francis bacon very present uh, as in, you know, I think he's present in most of everyone's art currently. If it's a composition, oh, it's the palette. Many yeah. So how you, what, what is it that that you feel you are taking from Francis' uh, discipline and from his uh, paintings? Well, um, the way I trap a painting, I use a flat air color to trap a painting. That's yeah. typically from Francis Bacon. I mean, a lot of artists do that today. Yeah. Uh, Van Gogh did that as well. I said Picasso. That. Yeah. That bacon. Um, I thought the chaotic studio is also very much. I don't know if you've seen images from Francis Bacon's uh, studios, art studio. I They're love a little studio, bit yeah. like, oh my god, there's like a little tube of paint everywhere. And um, you're talking before about creating like having only six colors and different different types of color. Do you yeah. mix them from 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 scratch? What is your process uh, when it comes to the more technical side of, of the color? Do you have like a preference of of uh, you know creating them with the basic primary colors, or have you really developed your technical skills so much that you know exact the numbers and you go and get them and then you work on that palette? Oh, my palette originates from um, Caravaggio. Ah. Like it is for many years because I love his work so much and I obsessed about him for many years and it sort of fed into the work. It also derives in part from uh, Mirandi and his restricted palette, you know, for the pot series. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's from those two areas, really. Um, but I, you know, yeah, it's mainly kind of about you. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, and I also see what you're doing here is that you're focusing your as a painter. That's your that's your what you're focusing is on the form, on the expression of the paint on a canvas. You're exploring it in a very like very intimate way. It does tell a lot about you too, although you may be representing others, and I can see that in your in your paintings. But then you've gone through minimal, you've gone to the minimalism in the way of very specific kind of shapes and, 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 and ways to do a face, almost like a comic, like very, almost very systematic. I can imagine that you're saying you're not thinking really when you're painting because it's almost like a reflex at this stage for you to do. And then you limit the palette, you always have the same kind of sizes almost. And that really brings, I think, a consistency that is really beautiful to see all over your, your paintings. And when I've been to your exhibitions, it's really enjoyable to see how they all look kind of the same, but then when you deep into each piece, it's so unique and so individual that it's 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 really beautiful to see that every every layer that of paint that you've put has made it really have its own character and be very specific, very unique. Yeah. So uh, you were saying about um, well, now we are all in this little crisis, you know, staying at home, having to rethink the way that we 
share our ideas and that we interact with each other. How are you, in your point of view, as an artist that you've been in the discipline for years and years, um, how do you see art connected to therapy and what is your takeaway on, on that? Uh, well, I can only speak for me personally and um, it's very important for me to paint psychologically. I need to paint, that's how I preserve my identity. I mean, that's always been the case for me from the very beginning. Um, I don't necessarily have to go to the studio. I don't, know, I don't necessarily have to paint every day. And I wouldn't describe it as a form of therapy as such, but it's just um, a mechanism to keep me in check, what we say. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I wouldn't describe it as therapeutic work. My painting is not therapy for me, but it just keeps me balanced. Yeah. Do you find it could give, it, yeah, maybe even it, it gives you like a, like a, like a sense of purpose? Yeah, I mean, before I became a painter, I had no identity. I had no real role in society or life or anything, really. So that was my great purpose. And it became my obsession. And my obsession is the work itself, not any one particular subject. I don't obsess over people, or particularly. It's, it's just the work itself and the methods. That's the obsession. Um, and with paint, painting generally. Yeah, how, because, you know, seeing your work, you're quite individual, uh, like you're a lonely artist, you know, many hours in the studio you spend, you work on, on many layers on one canvas, you work on your pra you know, practice, you've been quite systematic in having a very specific image that you've created by yourself that is easy to recognize. If you see a, a Matthew Tudor, you, you see, you know that it's a, it's a Matthew Tudor. Um, but then you also have a facet that is a little bit more inclusive and collaborative because you have a collective, you're running a lot of, you know, curating some exhibitions too. Do you feel that you're putting all the energy of being more interactive with society on that creative side versus then in your own practice as a painter? Um, I think I think there's a... I probably spend more time organizing the shows and the tunnel than I do actually painting. I don't spend that much time painting, to be honest. I spend more time organizing that, which I really enjoy. Yeah. I wouldn't exactly call myself a creator, more of an organizer, but I enjoy organizing things and I enjoy developing concepts. Um, but I don't, I mean, I go to the studio every day when I can, but I don't spend that much time actually working. It's maybe half an hour, an hour a day actual working it's more just being in the studio and making plans for shows you know which I really enjoy exhibiting because that's one of the points to being an artist to exhibit your work otherwise well it seems to be art in a way because if people don't see it or enjoy it or experience it there's no point to um, be doing it yeah you know so maybe that's something that you want to rethink uh, when you were saying about you doing different shapes and people thinking you just do portraits is you haven't showed the world. Are you planning on showing those other series that are not so much into portraits in the future or are you sticking into your portrait uh, box? Well, as you know, there were, there were some shows scheduled for April, which you were part of one of them, and that's all been stalled now until the hopefully Christ will pass and then we can start exhibiting again. Yeah. And I was planning to exhibit some figures. To yeah. challenge this idea that I'm just a portraitist, but we'll have to wait and see when that will happen. Yeah, yeah. But well, then you're opening up to that. And I also seen that yeah. you've actually started to use some red into your latest uh, portraits. That's, that's my recent series that began in September, my red phase, I call it. Because I've never used red before. I've always used black chalk or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a specific anecdote of how you got into that uh, trying red out, or it's just it's just red red wine? <laughs> well, uh, I um I, I painted a series of these portraits in September, and they're divided into two categories: the Madonna after Andrea Mantegna, which is a study of that, which is one of my favourite paintings by him, and also. The male portrait, which I'm calling Portrait D, or Portrait of D, which is a reference to William Blake, which is uh, one of my favourite paintings by William Blake, which is the great red dragon pursuing the woman clothed with the fires in the sun. And it's like a reinterpretation of that D standing for dragon. 
That's why I call it Portrait D. Oh. But, so, um, that's why Red, specifically, in reference to the Great Red Dragon. Great. Do you think, you, do you think that as a, you said before, you don't draw, you don't paint ideas, you paint, you are a painter, no? It's not about ideas, creation of ideas. Would, for example, because we may have people listening to this that they, they're not into art, they don't know anything about art. Would this be part of your explanation of your piece or would you let this be something that if the, if the audience gets it, they get it, but it's not something that really bothers you in your new series? Yeah, I, I, it doesn't matter to me how my work's interpreted. I mean, it's all, you, you always bring yourself to a painting or any work of art, you know, the audience brings themselves to you. So you're building a bridge between yourself and that person. They always bring their interpretation. And I think every interpretation of my work is valid, to be honest. People have said many things about my work over the years and I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's all interpretation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what, for painting, I think what makes a really interesting painting is when it's mysterious. You don't really fully understand it. I think I've always believed that. Mm. So, and to, yeah. to me, the less I understand something, the more I like it. So for you, it's it's maybe you're not doing like an like an art uh, expression. I was speaking to other people, so it's not about uh, trying to teach something to society or maybe to pinpoint something. For you, it's more about bringing up an idea or a thought or an impulse or feeling or something that you're very much interested in history so you always look back and explore and study study different t times of, of, the, of, the, of the civilization or maybe paintings or, or the artists. It's more for you to create this mysterious open questions where you're maybe creating something in the audience for them to become curious and explore and invest in it, research rather than giving responses and putting things in your face, no? Yeah. I, was I like I like what mentioned that I think I'm very interested in other people's ideas about my work. I think that's one of the things I find fascinating. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not really. I suppose, I suppose I am trying to influence people in a way, but um, I'm very much interested in what they bring. I don't, I, like I said earlier, I don't really think that much about my work. I analyze structures, like I said, but I don't, I don't intellectualize so much about it in that sense of the word, because I'm a very intuitive painter in many ways. It's observation and it's also accident, yeah. exploit and chance. Yeah, but you are a big researcher because, I mean, when yeah. I, yeah. you are, so tell us a little bit about those processes because from the Tunnel Collective, uh, I can see you're the one coming up with ideas. For me, it was great because you you guys were forcing me, or you as a creator, you were forcing me to read books that I have never read really, maybe from the English literature, because I'm Spanish and you know my, my literature background is a little bit different. But it was very interesting for me to see also the, 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 the depth of the research that we would do over poems, over books, over eras, over time. So, what is it? Where does this fascination of, of from history come from? Um, I've always been an avid reader. I mean, from from an early age, I've always had a fascination with history. I mean, the tunnel is is a very separate project from my work. I mean, that that's a concept group, and the, the whole idea was that we connected to society, we related to society. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where I am intellectualizing. That's where I'm developing concepts. Absolutely, I that's but that's I see that's very separate from what I do as an artist because we are a group, a large group, as you know. And yeah, I mean, some of our shows were very political. Some were based in literature, like you said, like T.S. Eliot's the Wasteland, which I thought was a very good show. And we're based in films, ideas. Um, but it's very much definitely about influence people's minds, the way they think, the way they think about art and the way they think about the world, definitely. Yeah. But I, I don't really do that with my work, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have like a little sketchbook where you're writing down every time you read something and you, oh, I note for the future. How do you keep record of your own research and, and you know, knowledge base? 
I find that really, cu I'm curious and I find it fascinating because I'm the person I have like million of those blogs. I always start an Excel, I always start a Word and I really never get the way to find really a uh, strong structure when it comes to research and have one methodology. How, what is your methodology to keep up all these influences? Um, maybe your memory is amazing. My memory is really bad. That's why you, I mean, you mean specifically in relation to the tunnel? The way that works. or in general when you or, do like all sorts of like artistic research and when you're exploring topics or when you read something well, I mean I, I read a lot of literature and um, I always mark the pages I like but a lot of my ideas in specifically for the tunnel are developed out of conversations with people I remember the things people say I, I absorb everything around me and I develop ideas and I extract from that so it's more it's it is research based I do a lot of research online uh, but it's mainly extracting from conversations with people, and that's why interaction with the tunnel and Germany is very important for me. Yeah. Obviously, it's what psychologically, but I extract, I absorb everything people say, and that's how I develop my concepts. I'm yeah. very influenced by people, and that's why. Yeah. Can you uh, maybe take a couple of minutes to explain what the tunnel is and you know your involvement and how it started? Because it's been going on for a while now. How long? Six years. Six years, yeah. It, it, we, it started as a gallery project um, on Viner Street. When Viner Street used to be the Cork Street of the East End, that was the place to be maybe seven or eight years ago. It's, it's desolate now. But the gallery we had closed, and I decided to keep the group together and create a show in Deptford a few months later, and I kept the group together, and it just gradually developed into a concept group, it gained momentum, more people came in, you came in, lots of people came in, and it developed into, well, really, I tried to create a movement with this group, which hasn't really been successful, it's more just a, a group, but it, the idea was to be part of a movement, you know, it's a very romantic idea, you know, like the Impressionists or the Dadaists or the Expressionists, you know, to have a new movement in an age where movements don't really exist. Yeah. They're almost redundant because artists are very individual now. They don't not really don't form groups like that. You get, you get certain exhi exhibition groups, but you don't have movements anymore. The last movement really was um, the Stuckist in the 1990s, which is a global movement, but that was just a to painters. Um, and that was the romantic idea I had about being part of a group and a sense of unity. Like, like the Impressionists, they were bound together and they stayed friends forever and they supported each other they sold work, they helped each other, there was that great sense of unity and that's what I was looking for. And also with the tunnel it was also doing something that wasn't painting, being stuck in my studio, obsessing about my work, being part of something meaningful that existed outside of painting. You know, something really that I feel is worthwhile and I still feel is worthwhile. It's you know um and um and also the friendships that have formed out of that group, the bonds that have formed, which are very strong with some of us. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's all I can say, really. I mean, it was, yeah, I think definitely a romantic idea of a movement. It is, and, and you've spoken a couple of times about identity and about purpose, and I do think that for some of us, when we've been in a very low moment, to have the tunnel and this collective, it did actually bring some order into our lives and you know there is a group of people that you can rely on that you will meet because we used to meet every week almost and just come up with crazy ideas sometimes it was the most productive meeting although my German side has to say they tend to be less productive but it was a moment of encounter and I think that's such an important thing that we now being at home in quarantine is such a frustration not to be able to meet people, to be together. And yes, it's virtual. We're having conversation here, but in those rooms, we were like 10 of us. And those meetings are really unique. No, they create this amazing like momentum for us uh, as individuals. It's, it's important. How, what, is your, what is your view on, on the importance of you know, the face-to-face -face and the meeting versus all this virtual, more like, you know, like uh, kind of like an iPad experience where you're not touching anything? Well, it's very artificial. It's very strange. Uh, uh, I, I, I do generally prefer face-to-face -face contact with people. I mean... Um, 
that's why, I, like you said, like I enjoyed the meeting so much. I mean, you, you can do a lot online, but it's so detached. And I like being in a room with people, experiencing them, you know, registering their emotions, talking about them, drinking with them. Um, the social aspect was always very important for me. And that's, like you said, if you moved into, moved into this artificial realm now where we're talking to screens, which is nice and it's enjoyable, but it's very strange at the same time because it's, it's still quite real yeah. in a very strange way. And I, I, I'm, right now I'm really missing the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully yeah. that'll return in the next few weeks or months, hopefully. <sighs> Maybe we should be, just uh, get a call and world. get everyone together. I think the tunnel is also quite special because you have these different disciplines. Now we have musicians and performance and then performance artists, you have painters, you have yeah. photographers. There is one example that I really like and particularly I hope I can interview her with it, which is Junko, which is one of those examples that she was there at the beginning almost in like, like an admin role, but like supporting us to put some organization in our chaotic life. And now she's started her own discipline and is an exceptional photographer. So I think that one of the takeaways that I always, when I look back at the time where I was more active in the tunnel was that, you know, it was a space of, in which everything was allowed. There was no wrong or right. And the idea of being accepted regardless of what you would do, I think it's such a unique and precious thing that we that we have that we shouldn't take for granted because it's it's quite unique and it's not like that in most groups and societies or many collectives in the world regardless of work or family or your neighborhood in your building yeah i mean that, that that's what was so special what is so special about it was the fact that we were so diverse to be eclectic mix of people yeah and um you know it, it, it didn't matter whether you'd been to university or not. It didn't matter what level you were at. It was just all about yeah. being part of something meaningful and worthwhile. And um, I think it is very unique. I mean, the social aspect is very unique as well because most groups, they just meet for a show. They yeah. plan it and that's it. They don't, they're not necessarily friends. Yeah. They're just, you know, colleagues working occasionally. So it is very original, and very unique and very special for that reason. Yeah, it felt to me when I would see you guys, it feels like going back home for Christmas. Like, you know where you're going to, you know who's going to be there. So last time I saw you, part of you guys was in the 100 years galleries that you, you've done a lot of collaborations and working with them. It's very cute space and very professional and nice people. And so it was a little bit like, I knew I could show up there alone and it would be fine because you guys would be there and I think that's that's such a very strong powerful feeling in this moment of isolation where even London regardless of the quarantine people feel lonely we are lonely we, we, we're quite individualist society so it's good to have some people where you can count on them and you feel like yeah this is part of my crew it's my gang yeah and being in a, a, any large city is a lonely experience for most people it's a very isolating experience in many ways, so groups like that are vital, I think, absolutely vital. Have you ever been told that there is a little bit of sadness into your art, or is that something you've never heard, or how you people, feel about people that? People use the word despair when they okay. talk about my paintings. Okay. <laughs> That's the word they commonly use, despair. Okay. Well, I get that all the time, know, too. Know, you and I, we're the same, you know, I get it all the time, like, Oh my god, Alicia, you're such a bubbly person, but you have to be so sad inside because everything you do is so sad. And I'm like, all right, maybe I am actually quite corrupted inside. I don't know. And um, Matthew, to finish up, um, there's this coming exhibition. We'll add the link from the tunnel and all the information on the video so people can 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 check it out. But it's a little bit of a little bit trick question. Maybe I'm throwing you under the bus because I haven't told you I'm going to ask you this. But if you were if you were not an artist. What would you actually be? I wouldn't be anything or anything purposeful. Because uh, I wasn't anything before I came to an arts. I just was a delinquent, <laughs> I suppose, really. I had no purpose. So I, I can't imagine not being one, to be honest. I can't imagine being something else. Uh, yeah. I never a, really yeah. thought about it. It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, um, I know, I like difficult questions. 
Right. I, I no, I think any that thought. you are such like artist. To be an artist is such a strong part of your identity. It's almost like you know, asking mm. someone don't look like you look, or maybe change my gender, or things like that. It's such a deep thing that runs in in, in us that you know some people don't understand because they have a job and one day they do one thing and then the other they do the other thing. And 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 to be an artist and to experience art like we do in a you know. 24-7, like it's in our skin. It's such a deep identity, mm. you know? It's an identity, it's a way of life. It's a way of experience in the world, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for your time, Matthew. It's always great to have a chat with you. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can bring a lot of people to your to the exhibitions that you're organizing with the tunnel and we can see all the other paintings that you were describing and telling us that, that we can't see right now on, on on the back of your of your of your studio. By the way, where is your studio now? Eurowatts in ah, Tottenham. Okay, so if people are around there they just can knock the door in and view. Is it at like an open open plan or is it you have a door and it's intimate? They're self contained, so okay. they're self isolating. That's why you can't go there. Mine is the same, yeah. Mine yeah, is exactly. also. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you.